I have the unfortunate position of being the last, which means everyone took their 15 minutes plus, and I'm left with five minutes. So I'm going to try to, I mean, I prepared uh, something. My, my interest is democratization and liberalization within an Islamic uh, context, but I've been uh, uh, interested in the radicalization debate Maybe because it's, it represents the antithesis of these ideas, and it's, 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 uh, it's something that has been encroaching about, up, upon our societies for a while. So I'm going to present to you, just to jump directly into the topic, I'm going to present to you what I call the radicalization roadmap. So this is the radicalization roadmap that we have uh, worked on. And basically, we have, what we have done is that uh, we've brought in as many uh, stories as possible from different uh, from different uh, uh, ideologies, from different radical ideologies, from different stories of radicalization, uh, in, in addition to uh, uh, stories of how people got radicalized, as well as radicalization manuals employed by the likes of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, etc. So can I just refer to it? Yeah. So this is, these are the steps, and I'm going, to, I'm going to go through them one by one, trying to, to you know, keep within my time. First is otherization. This is the idea that we are not the same. And this is a very poisonous idea once it infects society. It's the idea that we are different. You are one group, I am one group. We are different and we're separate. The second is collectivization, and this flows from there, where you say they're all the same. They're not only the other, they're also all the same. Now, if you look at one and two alone, what you have, if someone believes in one and two alone, what you have is a good old-fashioned bigot. It's someone who is bigoted. He doesn't have to be radicalized. Doesn't, but it flows. What, the pivotal point here is the oppression narrative. And we've heard a lot about the, this from the, the excellent speakers we, we, we listened to since morning. The oppression narrative is the idea that we are under attack. They are oppressing us. It's not only that they are the other. They are another who are attacking, actively attacking us. The problem with oppression narratives is that they're very deeply felt. They form a cornerstone of your very identity. And it's very difficult. Of course, they are, they are based on some facts, but uh, just like Haras uh, presented, not all of those facts are in, are in fact, not all of these are facts. Some of them are perceived and some of them are presumed. The problem with this is that it's very difficult to attack an oppression narrative from outside. It's very difficult for me. I'm, I'm, I come from a Palestinian background. And it's very difficult for, for someone who's, who's, let's say, an Israeli to convince me that I'm not, you know, that, that, that a historical injustice hasn't been done to my people. However, it's, it falls on me to question our own Palestinian terrorism. It falls on me, someone from within the group, to talk about it. And this is the case. This is why I enjoyed uh, some of the presentations before. It falls upon us as Muslims to, uh, to question our own oppression narratives. I cannot do it for you. And you cannot do it for me. The voice has to come from within. The next step, if we go, if we go further, is collective guilt. And this is the idea that they are all complicit. It's not only that they're all the same, and it's not only that they're all attacking us and we're oppressing us, they're all part of the plan. They're all complicit in attacking us, collective guilt. The next, and basically this is the flip side of the oppression narrative, is the supremacism narrative. We're better than them. Why are they attacking us? Why are they attacking us? Why are we oppressed? Because we are better than them. We, we have the, the, the correct faith. We're the only correct faith. We are a chosen people. We are civilized and they're barbarians, etc. So this is the idea that we are basically a supremacist idea, a supremacist premise. Next comes where we, where, we get, where we get into the dangerous territory, the idea of self-defense. The idea that the threat against us is so severe that anything is justified in, in the name of self-defense. That we are fighting for survival. And you see this a lot in, in, you know, in manifestos, radicalized manifestos, in, in their speeches, etc. They truly believe that they are fighting for self-defense, that they're not aggressing, that they're simply defending themselves. So we have to retaliate for their aggression and defend ourselves. The final point, and this is where we get into, the, into actual acts of terrorism, the idea of violence, the idea that 
Violence is the only way. There is no other way. The, the path, all other paths are blocked, and the only thing we can do is employ violence. And I want to, uh, I'm going to try to point your attention to certain facts on this. I just wrote them down over here. The first is that this is a continuum. It's not an either or. We, we often think of people as radicalized or de-radicalized, or radicalized and moderate. But the fact is that it's a, it's a continuum. There are people who believe in one to six, but they don't believe in violence. And they ex express their, you know, their radicalization in different ways. There are people who believe in one, two, and, and three, and four, for example, and, but you know, they don't believe that they're a particularly supremacist. Uh, so this is one point. When we, when we look at these things, we have to, we have to, what, we have to ask where our, our particular people are. The second is the idea of ideology. And uh, what we've done here is basically presented a meta-ideology. It's basically uh, a pattern which ide ideologies follow. My problem with focusing on ideology alone is that it's, 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 it, you cannot, you, you cannot uh, uh, legislate on that behalf because what are you going to do? Are you going to ban the ideology? Are you going to uh, restrict freedom of speech? Are you going to uh, you know, enforce a, a, an inquisition to see whether people believe these things or not? You have to go behind that and ask why are people adopting this ideology? Uh, and the interesting thing that we found out here is that we think this is a religious ideology. We say it's religiously motivated. But in fact, it's a tribal ideology. It's, it's, it's more of nationalistic than religious. It's, it's the politicization of a religious identity rather than, I mean, whenever people say it's religiously inspired, it's, it's not exactly religiously motivated. It's religiously justified. And of course, those justifications form a kind of cement which makes it difficult for the person to, you know, to, 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 to abandon it. Um, the important and exciting thing about, about, about this roadmap is that we can reverse it. If you look at this and, and, and if you look at otherization, there are ways to, to, to reverse otherization, to actually come together, have cultural events, meet each other, etc., to realize that we're not all that different. Uh, and the same goes on. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't want to encroach into the time for the panel, but uh, it's interesting to see that this, is not, this, is, this roadmap is not irreversible. But the fact is, it's kind of like painting yourself into a corner where the more steps you take forward, it becomes difficult to go back. And this is why when we talk to someone who has, who is, who has uh, fulfilled all the seven points, we cannot go back and convince them that he is not that, you know, to, to give up on the idea of otherization. We have to attack the idea of violence first. Um, finally, I'm going to uh, close with a little uh, tribute to the medium that I use the most, which is Twitter. So uh, the, the problem with, uh, one problem with, with the radicalization debate is that the language that we use is so ambiguous. And because it's ambiguous, it's so easy for, for you know, it's either easy for people who want to get out of the debate to weasel out of it, and it's also easy for us to, you know, to use the same words to attack other people. I see radicalization as the antithesis of liberalism. The idea of liberalism and democracy are built upon equality. Equality as in one man, one vote in democracy, and equality as in equality before the law and equality in human rights for liberalism. And I believe that radicalization should be defined, maybe, maybe radicalization is not the right word, but the concept that we're trying to attack, I think, should be defined in terms of human rights. If you believe that some people have more rights than others, then you're already radicalized. The rest is just a matter of scope. If you believe that some people should have less legal rights, as in enshrined in law, than others, then you're already radicalized. It's just a matter of scope after that. And I'm going to close on that. And thank you for listening to me, and thank you for the floor. And we can have the panel next. Thank you.